So welcome back. And this is our last lecture. And what we're going to do today is to try to uh, uh, this, derive these copper cluster equations, which we are going to look at. And yesterday we looked at a diagrammatical uh, approach to it. And this is something which uh, can be very intuitive and allows you, when you're writing down the diagrams, it allows you to, from the diagrams, to extract the expressions. And <clears throat> I wanted to continue along this diagrammatic line because that gives you all the diagrams by simply combining the so-called wave operator terms with the interaction term by some simple rules like we did in perturbation theory. Except that now we are going to have a kind of iterative approach where we keep iterating uh, again and again, and every time the wave operator gets more and more correlations baked in. So the uh, what we did last uh, yesterday, so let me just switch back to the uh, slides which we had. Let me bring up this. So we uh, started with a, a general derivation of the uh, Hamiltonian, which we're going to deal with. And this Hamiltonian is going to be a Hamiltonian, which is normal order. And this Hamiltonian, which you can think of something which is being contracted with a, this wave operator. This is the way you can interpret that uh, uh, operator T. You can combine that in all possible unique combinations that satisfy given form. Now, since in our case, we don't have uh, any other state than the ground state, that means that we are looking at expectation values from ground state to ground state. And that means in turn that we uh, are going to have an excitation level when it comes to number of particle and whole states, which is equal to zero. So we normally call that a zero particle, zero whole state. And we define this uh, excitation level uh, zero, one, uh, or up to two, or we can actually think of uh, uh, higher excitation levels as well. And we can contract this H zero with zero, one, or several elements of the wave operator. The uh, uh, terms which we defined then were these uh, so-called excitation levels after we had defined particle and whole lines. So we defined an excitation level in terms of the number of uh, particle hole excitations. But we would also have a level zero when we have an incoming particle and an outgoing particle. However, when we then are calculating the uh, final expectation value, we have to make sure that we have no uh, particle lines or hole lines remaining. They should all be contracted. Okay. So for the one body operator, we can then design it like this, where we have a one particle, one whole state, which is being de-excited or, or annihilated. And here we create a one particle, one whole state. And similarly, we could do the same thing with the uh, two body interaction. And the thing now is that we have only a two body interaction at most. And then you can create at most two particle, two whole excitations. If you have a free body interaction, you can actually create a free particle, free hole excitation. If you have a four body interaction, et cetera, et cetera, then you can create more complicated interactions. So that means that if you have only a two body Hamiltonian, you will create more complicated interactions when you now let these particles interact many different times. And these were the excitation levels. So what, you, what we ended up doing then is to, uh, uh, look at expectation values of uh, the uh, operators with the Hamiltonian, with these uh, so-called wave operators or correlation operators, or in this case, these are going to be called cluster operators. So you have a one particle, one whole excitation, and that's being created. So that has a level of plus one. And then similarly, you have a a two-body operator, which has a, what we will call a level plus two. So with these elements, we can now bring these together and we can find all different types of expectation values. So the uh, 
uh, when we look at the ground state, the expectation value from the ground state ansatz to the ground state ansatz, there are no external lines. The final excitation level is zero and the fi initial excitation level is zero. So you can then, when you now look at the elements of the Hamiltonian, you can then bring them together with the elements which you have from this cluster operator. And in this case, we are dealing with one particle, one hole excitations and two particle, two hole excitations. And these operators then, these bars here, when you keep iterating, they will contain more and more complicated types of it interactions. So in the beginning, this operator, which you see here, before you start iterating, this operator will actually be given by these diagrams here. But the reason why you put a bar is that gradually, as you keep iterating, this will contain more and more complicated interactions. So you would have then a uh, set of uh, elements which you just need to match. So that at the end, when you bring together these guys, which means that you're taking the contractions. So this has creation and annihilation operators, and these have creation and annihilation operators. And then you simply bring together the different lines. So it's you actually putting lines together and respecting the final excitation level and the initial excitation level. If you do that, then you will find that the only possibility is actually these diagrams here. And you can derive the same thing analytically by paper and pencil when you write down the equations. And we will see that later, how you can do that. But I wanted to give you the kind of diagrammatic approach first, because that gives a much easier way to derive it by simply bringing together the different legs here and look at the different excitation levels. So you have some simple rules to use. And then you see now that if you take uh, this operator here, that's a level of plus two, this is a level plus two, that gives you plus four. So that can never give anything meaningful. So the only thing which can contract with this guy here is actually this one. Uh, but this one can actually have this piece being attached to this leg and this piece again being attached to that leg. And it's easy then when you look at this uh, uh, nomenclature to actually be able to find out that these are the only diagrams which pop up. And then uh, uh, that means that when you then want to write down the equations, you use the diagram rules because you found the, all the diagrams which contribute. And then you can just sit down and derive the analytical expressions, which at the end, because at the end, you cannot bring this to a computer, right? You have to bring in some kind of uh, analytical expressions, which you translate into, into a program. So when you look at the diagram rules, you sum over all the internal indices, label all lines, you extract the matrix elements, uh, you extract the cluster amplitudes with indices in the order left to right, as you do, do with the interactions. And then you calculate the phase, which is number of whole lines plus loops, and you multiply by a factor of a half for each equivalent line and each equivalent vertex. So these are the same rules which you use when you set up diagrams. And when you do that, the first term here, and when you're looking at these terms here, this is a kind of more compact notation where you actually, what you do then is that you have what's called an Einstein summation. Are you familiar with that notation? So that means that uh, this compact notation means that you're summing over A and I here. So this term, which you see here, is actually this term, which you see here. So I'm summing over A, the particle line, and I, the whole line, I have the amplitude here and I have the interaction matrix element here. And similarly here, I'm actually summing over IJ and AB. And if we then remember what we did in many body perturbation theory to second order, this would be given by this interaction matrix element divided by the number of, by the whole states minus the particle states. So in many body perturbation theory, we have an expression order by order for these amplitudes. So these are normally called, these coefficients here are called amplitudes. And in the final one, 
what we have now is a, a TIA and TJB here, and the, ampli the similar amplitudes here, and that would correspond to this diagram here. So if you're thinking of the pairing model, which we have in the final midterm, if you look at, if you think back to the pairing model, now you can ask yourself, which diagrams are included if I'm dealing with a pairing model and no broken pairs? The middle one only. That's the only one which would appear. So, uh, and, and you see that also in the midterm, if you go to second order in perturbation theory, the only term which you have to second order in perturbation theory is actually this diagram in the midterm. So if we now write it down here a little bit and just go back to the here. So I wanted to link some of the discussions which we do here also to the midterm. So if you look at the uh, the diagram which we had in copper cluster theory, so C, C, S, D, this is singles and doubles as we put up. And then we had a diagram which looks like this. So we have the whole lines and the particle lines, the interaction here, and then we have this line. And then we put labels on it. So we have A, B, and I and J. So in copper cluster theory, this is a diagram which then would read one divided by four. And then we have a sum of A, B, I, J. And then we have the matrix elements for the interaction on the top. So I normally always, when I write these diagrams, I start with the top interaction element because the way you can think of this is that you let the particles interact many, many times. And then the system gets de-excited and you're back to the ground state. This is one way to read the diagrams. So I would always put up the last interaction, which is the one which brings you back to your ground state. If you're calculating a an expectation value. So in copper cluster theory, this is given by this amplitude, TIJAB. If you do many body perturbation theory to second order, MBPT to second order, then the equivalent diagram is given by the two interaction vertices. Again, you put labels. You have two equivalent pairs. And in that case, what we have is an expression which goes like one over four. We have the sum over the intermediate states, I, J, and B. And then we have I, J, V, A, B. And then we have A, B, V, I, J. And then we have an epsilon i plus epsilon j minus epsilon a minus epsilon b. And what we have in this case is that this amplitude, which we have here, in second order perturbation theory, it corresponds to this quantity here. So in copper cluster theory, when you keep iterating, so you would normally start with this as a guess for this amplitude, and then you start iterating the equations. And that means that every time you iterate, you build in correlations of this type here and more and more co complicated correlations. So it means that this diagram, which you see here, could, after one iteration, it could contain a new interaction vertex here. So in reality, that would correspond to a third order diagram in perturbation theory. And when you keep iterating, you should be able to sum up this type of two particle to whole excitations to infinite order. So in principle, what this means here is that you can have an infinity of these interactions in here, which then are all collected in terms of this, what you might call a renormalized two body wave operator. So that's the basics of the copper cluster recipe uh, with the exponential ansatz. So this is just to keep things uh, or just to show the similarities. The other thing is that when you do the uh, uh, the midterm now, since you only have a system where you don't break a pair, your Hamiltonian can only produce 
excitations represented by these diagrams here. So that would be the only diagram which pops up in copper cluster theory and in many body perturbation theory to second order. We, did, we discussed that partly yesterday as well. So let's go back to the, uh, to the slides. So the next thing we want to do then, um, we label all lines, you have the expression here with the Einstein summation. But then the next thing you want to do is, since we want to zero out these matrix elements, so this is normally what you in linear algebra would call a similarity transformation where you zero out specific matrix elements. So I want to zero out this block here. So in a certain sense, also going back to uh, the second midterm, this will be an extension of, of the Hartree-Fock theory because it's going to involve more complicated terms. So you could think of this as a kind of generalized type of Hartree-Fock transformation. So remember now that when we did the Hartree-Fock, the way we discussed it, we looked at a transformation from, or we actually what we did was to set the matrix elements between the zero particle, zero hole block. We have only one state. We assume that the ground state is non-degenerate. And then we zeroed out the matrix elements between that state and all the one particle, one hole states. And when we use this uh, uh, condom slater rule for calculating these matrix elements, we found that this one was just given in terms of this operator F. And then we simply require that that piece is equal to zero. Yeah. And uh, in copper cluster theory, what we are doing then is to actually set these matrix elements to zero now. And then, uh, what we have then is a pair of particle hole lines. So this is the operator itself, which we want to end up with. So what we are doing now is that we start with the operator here, but since these are the expressions for the T1 amplitudes, we actually want to end up with a new one particle, one hole excitation. So that means that we can now bring back, so we want a final excitation level of plus one, so we want to have a one particle, one hole operator, which is now being iterated upon so that we have a, a to combine the elements here. These are the elements. And then we are going to match all these elements with both these elements, with all these elements from the Hamiltonian, which give rise to a level plus one. So that means that we are now going to perform contractions so that we end up with a one particle, one whole state. So if you look at, for instance, this diagram here, this one, I can contract that one with this. And that will give me a one particle, one whole state left, level of excitation plus one. I can also uh, take the uh, expectation value, I can start looking at the other ones here, so if you now look at, for instance, uh, uh, this specific operator here, this has a zero level. But if I match that one, for instance, with this one, this has level plus two, I would then contract this and this with that one. But then I would be left with a one particle, one hole, and one particle, one hole here. So that would be excitation level of plus two. If you then look at the... Uh, this specific uh, element in the uh, operator, you can now, if you want to match that with uh, any of these, you could now think of uh, having, as I said, this one with that one, this one here. If you then look at this one, I could match that one with this. So this one and that one could now contract with these uh, one particle, one whole pairs here and you will be left with that one coming out. So when you combine all of these, what you end up with is something which looks like this. So these are all the possible diagrams, which you then would get as one particle, one whole excitations. So just keep in mind now that when we are putting all these to zero, 
that means that we are now producing a final state, which is a one particle, one whole excitation by definition here. So the final excitation level should be plus one. And you see that in all these states here, we are left with now a one particle, one whole state. We have a one particle, one whole state here. So we're just performing all the possible contractions which we can make and just bringing together all these elements. So if you then look at these types of excitations, since we are left with a one particle, one whole state, it means that in uh, the midterm which we have, none of these are going to contribute because we cannot break a pair. If you could break a pair, we would have to be a little bit more careful. But in midterm, all these guys here, they just disappear. So if you want to do a couple cluster theory calculation uh, or just set it up, for instance, for the final examination, you could uh, take the second midterm and present the uh, FCI theory, discuss that, part three, four, the uh, money body perturbation theory. So in the essence, when you make the final presentation, you could go through all the methods. And then you could say, due to the specificity of this model, which we have in the second midterm, if I do copper cluster theory, then all these diagrams disappear because they produce a one particle, one whole state, which is not allowed by the symmetry of the system which we have decided on. And we have decided that you cannot break any pairs. You can do that, but then uh, you would have other types of states. So that would lead to something which in copper cluster theory uh, leaves only double excitations, which means that the S is gone. So you would just call that CCD couple cluster with only doubles. So again, uh, when you look at these diagrams, you can then, from the diagrams, you can then extract the analytical expressions which you have to program. And I will show you later how you would calculate all these analytical expressions. And that's a kind of a very, very exciting exercise in uh, usage of the anti-commutation rules. So if you like this, as you're doing now in the second midterm with the, all the uh, contractions, this is an even more exciting exercise, which is also something you would program using uh, in Python. There's a second quantization package, which you could use. But again, you would now label all the uh, lines, the sum of internal indices. You would extract the matrix elements using diagram rules. You would extract the couple, the cluster amplitudes with indices. You calculate the phase factor as before, and you would multiply with a factor of a half for each equivalent pair. And then you can write down, if you now go back to the diagrams which we had, you, if you look at the first one, this is just this matrix elements F. This would be a term where we sum over a particle state here. So if you think of this second diagram here, you have a particle state you're summing over, and you will see now that there's a summation here over the particle state E. And then you have a, a further terms here, and you will see that there are also terms which involve a two particle, two whole excitation as well. But in our case, we cannot break a pair. So that would be the T1 amplitude equations. And these are the equations with Einstein summations, which you would have to program when you're solving the copper cluster equations with the single ex types of excitations. And the idea is to zero out the uh, a part of your Hamiltonian matrix, as we discussed yesterday. So the next thing you would do then is to uh, zero out these matrix elements. These uh, excitations will produce in one way or the other one, more complicated excitations than two particle, two hole. But what we are saying here is that the free particle, free hole excitations are all put to zero. So we won't have an equation here where we zero out that part of the Hamiltonian matrix. So with a two body interaction, these are zero. However, uh, with the free particle, free hole, eh? so if you have a, but you would have a 
free particle, free hole, which connects with a one particle, one hole. And these matrix elements are all zeroed out in this kind of similarity transformation we are doing here. So it's a simplification of the problem. So in this case, uh, we are going to repeat the same exercise. So we uh, want a final state, which is, a, as you can see, this one brings us from the ground state. And you can think of this box as you starting here with the ground state. And then you have lots of the garbage which takes place in here. And then you end up with a two particle, two hole state. That means that you need to have something which looks like this at the end. And that's an excitation level of plus two. These are the operators you want to contract with a Hamiltonian. So clearly, if you now look at this diagram here, one case which you can link up with is actually this one. So you would contract this particle hole pair with that one. You have a one particle hole pair which is left uncontracted. And then you have a one particle one hole pair here. So that's a diagram which would give you something which uh, would contribute. This diagram here would give you level plus two, level plus two, so that would be plus four. So that would be give, give you the wrong excitation level. You can then bring together the further diagrams. So you can now think of, if you look at this uh, diagram, which you see here, if you look at that one. So what you could think of then is that this has a one particle, one hole. So this is a level plus one, level plus two, so that wouldn't fit. So that wouldn't give you a two particle, two hole state. If you, on the other hand, take this diagram and you contract that one with, you take the particle line here and contract with the particle line here. You have a whole state here. You would have a particle state here. And that gives you also a two particle, two hole excitation. Because this has excitation level plus one, plus one. So that gives you plus two. So you see the basic recipe. So it's just you sitting down and bringing all the legs together and then just paying attention to you ending up with a state which looks like this, which is a two particle, two hole excitation. Can you contract with three diagrams? No, you cannot do that because you have the wave operator, which is being contracted with the Hamiltonian. But I will show you, you, you're actually going to get terms. So at the end, you're going to get something ugly like this. So you can have uh, uh, you can have two wave operator or three wave operators which appear. So if you look at, for instance, this case, you can have uh, four T1 operators. So that means that there's going to be, and this has to do, uh, and as we will see now, when we are going to write out the equations, you can actually have a T1 to the power of four. And this is due to the exponential character of the ansatz which you're making. So that is going to give you a diagram like this, where you have uh, four one particle, uh, one hole uh, operators, which are then being contracted. So that gives you an excitation level of plus four. But then you have an excitation level of minus two here. So that takes away uh, two of the particle hole states and you get up with a, four part, a two particle two hole state at the end. So these are all the possible contractions you can make by respecting the type of excitation levels you want to have. If you were to look at the free particle free hole uh, block, you would get many more diagrams to look at. Actually, when you do the combinatorics, you will find out that you have a close to a thousand diagrams. So that quickly blows up. So that's why copper cluster theory is an approximative method, because if you want to deal with all the uh, possible uh, excitations which you have, like we discussed yesterday, when you when we looked at this non-practical way of setting up the FCI equations, then you would end up with uh, the same complexity as you have with uh, FCI calculations, actually even more. So in this case, we would have then uh, the different diagrams which we need to plug in. So if you now want to look at the uh, couple clusters with uh, doubles only, with doubles only, that means that the uh, diagrams like 
if you now look at the doubles only, this would disappear. You don't have a T1 amplitude anymore. This would disappear. This would also disappear. This would disappear. And many of these diagrams would disappear. And the only one which would remain then would be diagrams which only include the two particle, two hole amplitude, which would be diagrams of this type, of this type here, would have diagrams of this type. If you take away the singles, this would disappear, that would disappear, that one would disappear. You would be left with this one, this one, and this one again, and same with that one. This would be out because you don't have a, a one particle, one whole part. So all the diagrams which have, if you do the take away singles excitations, it means that the previous case with the equations for the T1 amplitude disappear. And all the T1 amplitudes which are in here, like this one, that one, this one, all those which include the T1 amplitude, they disappear. And then you would only be left with diagrams of uh, this type here. So we'd have one, two, three, four, and then you have five, six, seven, eight, and then there should be a ninth diagram here somewhere. Maybe I'm counting wrongly here. Yeah, I think there are eight diagrams. Yeah, that's correct. Eight diagrams to the, when you only have that, only doubles excitations. And then if you look at these diagrams, you can quickly see in the second midterm, which one should be included or not when you don't break any pairs. So you would typically then find that this diagram here, where you have a two particle, two hole, clean two particle, two hole excitation, or a two hole excitation here, this is a case where you, which you would keep because you uh, don't break any pairs there. If you look at this diagram, you're actually breaking a pair. So that would not be included. And uh, similarly with a, a diagram like this one, you will be breaking a pair, but here you would not be breaking a pair. So that would be a diagram which would be included. So if you write down the, uh, if you use the diagram rule, so you actually have to write all these contributions. So you would again label all lines, sum of internal indices, calculate the phase, multiply by the factors, anti-symmetrize a pair of external particle whole lines, because this is an operator now. So you need to anti-symmetrize the final lines. And then the anti-symmetrization comes in in these factors which you have here, where you can permute i and j. So the first term is given by this diagram here, which is anti-symmetrized, but then we need to permute the a and b cases. So we take into account to all possible ways the uh, particles a and b can actually be, because if you look at like this diagram here, when you write down the diagram, in this specific case, the uh, two particle lines, which you see here, they can actually, you should actually anti-symmetrize this final state, which comes out here. So these are just some small technicalities. And these will be the equations uh, which you end up with in a, uh, a Einstein summation formulation of it. And you see clearly now that you have uh, matrix elements which combine uh, an interaction with a one-body operator. And here we have a, a one-body operator multiplied with a uh, the uh, amplitude. But then you see that when we move down here, we can actually have uh, amplitude squared multiplied with matrix elements. And then at the end, we actually have a case where we have the T1 amplitudes to the power of four. So these are the equations which you can derive by looking at a diagrammatic expression. So the thing which we're going to do now is actually to look at all these ugly beasts here, because this is the way it's gonna look like when you now write out the uh, different terms. But let's, uh, so let's just move back then to the, uh, to the slides. So let me just put that one up.
So just to remind you, we have a, a reference state like this, and we have opted for a Hamiltonian, which is going to be given by the single particle piece plus the two body interaction. We have rewritten that in terms of a normal ordered Hamiltonian, where this is normal order with respect to the new vacuum. And these matrix elements, F, Q, and P, they are now given by the single particle basis. And then we have the matrix elements of the interaction here. And uh, this is normally called the Fock matrix. Uh, and this would be typically diagonal in the Hartree Fock basis. So let's just move on a little bit. And uh, what we did yesterday was to introduce this uh, uh, exponential ansatz, where we have assumed that this operator T is an operator which now induces correlations. And what we want to demand is that the correlated state becomes an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian Hn. So we would have Hn multiply with this psi, and that's given by psi here. Uh, it's, however, not the most productive one, uh, because this actually brings us back to the uh, problems which we had before. So the idea then is to left multiply the Schrodinger equation with e to the minus t. And that means that we define a uh, similarity transformed Hamiltonian. And then what we are going to solve then is to have this rewritten in terms of a, a similarity transformed Hamiltonian, which acts on these states, and that gives us the correlation energy. So that's the basic uh, mathematics which we end up doing. And you may ask now what actually leads to this, what would be a requirement for having this to be Hermitian? The equations which are set up here, they don't need to be Hermitian. And you know that if you want it to be Hermitian, you would actually have to require that this E of T is a unitary transformation. And that means that T has to be anti-Hermitian. The way we have defined it, if you think back to the creation and annihilation operators for T1 and T2, it's easy to see that this is not satisfied by the way we have defined the operators T1 and T2. So that means that our operator, the way we have defined it, this T operators is not going to be lead to a unitary transformation. And that will break the variational principle. And it's going to give us, in principle, an effective Hamiltonian, which is non-Hermitian. And that means that the left and the right eigenvalue problem are not going to give you the same basis states. And you can also ask the... Uh, uh, that h of n has the same eigenvalues as of h of n for an arbitrary t. And you can actually see that by simply performing the operations here. So you have h of n times e of t. So you just put in unity here. And this is just an eigenstate. This is the energy. And then you multiply with e to the minus t from the left. And then you can you redefine this operator. So that means that this E here is an eigenstate of H of N. Uh, with eigenvalue E, then this E of minus T is an eigenstate of this transformed Hamiltonian. So the whole idea now is that this E minus T times E is going to be the way you operate on the state. So that means that if E of minus T times E is equal to E of T times phi zero, then we are going to have uh, the uh, expression which we put up here, that this uh, wave function, which we're looking after, is going to be E of t times phi zero. So if I multiply with E minus t here, then I'm getting back to phi zero. So the uh, uh, this is also a question here, I mean, how many unknowns we end up with. Uh, I'm coming back to that one a little bit later. But if you now look at the typical approximation, which is made in copper cluster theory, that is that we would set up T now to be given by these two operators. We limit ourselves to T1 and T2. It means that the uh, 
cluster amplitudes are going to create a state like this and a state like that. So if you act with this T1 on phi zero, there will be a state phi i a, which is going to be a one particle, one hole excitation. And similarly, when we act with this one on the ground state ansatz, we are going to get a, a two particle, two hole excitation. But clearly it will also involve these unknown coefficients. And what we want to do is to zero out this matrix element with this specific Hamiltonian here. And uh, the first equation states that the copper cluster correlation energy is an expectation value of the similarity transformed Hamiltonian. The second and third equation state that the similarity transformed Hamiltonian exhibits no one particle, one hole, and no two particle, two hole excitations. That's actually what we are saying here in the actual evaluation of these equations. Now, the uh, drawback with a copper cluster theory now is that you have a similarity transformed Hamiltonian. So that means that if you want to uh, look at other properties than the ground state, you need to use this similarity transformation on all creation and annihilation operators and then compute a new operator. So every new operator has to be similarity transformed. And that leads to a much more involved type of calculations if you want to calculate other expectation values than just the ground state energy. And uh, these equations are the equations which we looked at diagrammatically and which you have to solve with uh, in order to find these unknown amplitudes. And then you can use these amplitudes to compute the correlation energy uh, from the first line here. As we discussed uh, yesterday, where we had the energy, which depends on the amplitudes T, I, A, and the two particle, two hole amplitudes. What's also important to keep in mind here is that this is not an exact eigenstate. Uh, the reference state, we know that. Uh, it is decoupled from simple states, but H bar, bar here, it connects uh, this state to three particle, three hole and four particle, four hole states. As you saw from that diagram, where we could actually have intermediate three particle, three hole and four particle, four hole states. So typically, and this is a kind of rule of thumb, is that these copper cluster theory with singles and doubles give you roughly 90% of the exact correlation energy. And this is the case in atomic, molecular, and also nuclear physics and condensed matter physics. And uh, where well, this is the difference between the exact energy and the hartree fock energy. Triples typically bring you closer to 99%, but that means that you have many more equations to solve. So the copper cluster method uh, in this type of approximation is a, uh, it yields a similarity transformed Hamiltonian that is of a two-body structure with respect to non-trivial vacuum. So the copper cluster method transforms an A-body problem into a two-body problem, albeit with respect to non-trivial vacuum. If you do money-body perturbation theory, you're also dealing with a money-body state, but you evaluate just two-body matrix elements. But in principle, you're actually summing over all the money body states. And by doing the contractions, you end up with the sums over different single particle states. So you can simplify the equations that way. So one of the things is that, uh, as you also saw, uh, if you do the CCD case for the pairing problem, if you now go back to the midterm, for the pairing problem, what you will see is that if you look at the case you have in the midterm, the CCD with two particles is going to be exact. That's going to give exactly the same result as you diagonalizing with uh, two particles only, a two-body problem. So CCD and or CCSD, if you have a two-body problem, it's going to give you the same answer as full configuration interaction theory in that basis. That's actually not, so that's a very useful check 
that you have implemented the equations correctly. But then nevertheless, the CCD is not a uh, is is not the extra correlation energy, and you can say that see that that it does not make phi zero an exact eigenstate of this term. It is only an eigenstate with a similarly transformed Hamiltonian, which is truncated at most to two particle two whole states. So this full one with t equal two would involve six body terms. Uh, there's a question to you and. This full Hamiltonian would reproduce the exact correlation energy. So CCD is a similarity transformation plus a truncation, which decouples the ground state only from two particle two whole states. So after the break, uh, I wanted to show you what this is going to look like. So I'm, I'm going to go a little bit quickly through this because I uh, maybe it's kind of. I was hoping that I could have started a little bit early with copper cluster theory. So I hope you don't get offended if I abuse a little bit with slides. But one of the things which we discussed in connection with the Thales theorem is this baker campbell hausdorff expansion. The thing now is that we cannot write T out in terms of, uh, uh, the, because T contains not T1 and T2. So we cannot write the exponential of t as e to the power of t1, e, e of t1 multiplied with e of t2, because t1 and t2 do not commute. So the operators which you have here are operators which do not commute. So that means that uh, uh, if you look at this expression here for the exponential ansatz, the problem we face then is that we cannot simplify this one to be just the product of exponentials with each type of amplitude. And you can quickly see that, that these do not commute, because if you take this one and calculate the anti-commutator with that one, you will find that that is non-zero. So that means that we have to use this uh, uh, baker campbell hausdorff and then we get series of nested commutators. However, you can show that uh, with uh, a two-body interaction, and you do this CCSD, this truncates at the order of uh, four folds here. However, to get back the equations, which I put up previously from a diagrammatic point of view, you have to perform all these anti-commutators. And this is what I wanted to show you after the break. <laughs> So the diagrammatic approach, in a certain sense, is doing this for you. If you want to not involve a diagrammatic approach, you have to go through all the calculations of all the commutators here. However, that's always a good exercise. It's not a very exciting exercise, as you probably are feeling now with the first midterm. You also had it in the second midterm. So the that's why the diagrammatic approach is so popular because you can actually just bring together diagrams, find the right level of excitations, and then simply bring together all the legs by thinking of these as contractions, and then you would have the expressions. And when you have the diagrams, you just read off the expression for the equations you have to cope with. I think we should take a small break, right? Should we do that? I'm gonna put the recording on pause. So we're going to use the, um, the the last lecture now, or parts of the last lecture, to discuss the uh, uh, how we can calculate these equations with copper cluster theory. So in practice, what we end up with, since these operators T1 and T2 do not commute, we cannot rewrite the exponential you see here in terms of a product of an exponential with T1 and an exponential with T2. And then we have to invoke this uh, baker campbell hausdorff expansion. And that means that we have sets of nested commutators, which we have to evaluate. Now, however, due to the fact that our Hamiltonian has at most a two-body interaction, which means that we can produce something like an excitation level of plus two, when we now combine these different operators and calculate expectation values, then you will see now that 
these different expectation values, no, not expectation values, but operators, they will produce a set of excitations. And in our case, then, uh, since we limit ourselves to a two-body interaction, you can then show that the terms which give something which is non-zero are terms up to the fourth fold here of commutators. And that simplifies things a little bit, but still you have to evaluate this. And you can then see why this diagrammatic approach is often favored, because if you have all the topologically distinct diagrams for the operators and the T2 and T1 amplitudes, you can then simply uh, join them together in uh, by using the contractions of different lines. And then you have uh, simply to draw all possible diagrams. And from the diagrams, you extract the analytical expressions. And it's always a useful exercise if you want to venture into copper cluster theory to uh, go through the calculations of all these different terms and look at the diagrammatic expansion. And when you get some feel for it, if you then uh, uh, look at free particle, free hole excitations, it's then easier sometimes to actually write down the diagrams and calculate all the, the truncations there. So the disadvantage, uh, this is actually something which I'm not proving now, but I'm simply stating that. So the disadvantage here is that when you do this and you have an, an operator which is not unitary, this is not a unitary transformation due to the definition of T1 and T2, that means that uh, we will get something which is non-emission. However, with this approximation, this series will terminate. If we, on the other hand, want to use something which is called the unitary copper cluster approach, then this series will not terminate. So this is something which we're not going to demonstrate here in this course, but if you're interested, we could discuss this more apart. And uh, for those of you who are interested in this course, which is called Physics 5419, which is quantum computing, uh, these are things which can be discussed there. So there is a, a emission version of copper cluster theory, which is called a unitary copper cluster theory. And uh, uh, this is also very, very interesting when you look at quantum computing. So if you're interested, I, I had actually a PhD student who did this, a unitary copper cluster theory applied to the Hamiltonian, which you're looking at in at the midterm. The, uh, and this is something which can easily be reproduced. And, and when you do quantum computing, you need unitary operators. So you cannot use the standard copper cluster theory in quantum computing because your Hamiltonian would not be, or your transformed Hamiltonian is not unitary. The advantage here is that this series truncated a given order of nested commutators. If you have a free body interaction, you need up to six next nested commutators. And that gives you many more equations to plug in to the amplitudes for uh, T3, T1, and T2. So the um, equations which we end up with then, when we are calculating uh, expressions, so you would end up with a Hamiltonian now, which would then be defined in terms of this similarly transformed Hamiltonian. So you would have this as your Hamiltonian, and then you have the, the um, uh, expressions where you now link these with a, a, a particle whole state and a two particle two whole state. Now, what I want to do now is to switch back to the uh, slides, and then we are going to look at how we can calculate this chain of nested commutators, which follow from the baker campbell house of expansion. So let's take a look at that. So the, as I said, the diagrammatic approach uh, is pretty convenient in the sense that it allows us to uh, write down the diagrams, and from the diagrams, we can then derive the expressions by using the standard diagram rules, which we've gone through. And we get many more terms here, but still this is something which is doable. And uh, to compute the copper cluster with singles and doubles is something which is quite straightforward. The only problem is that you have to be careful. Uh, it's easy to mistype things. 
And in the textbook of Shabit and Bartlett, there is actually an error, so which is unavoidable. And so it's very useful to actually derive these terms yourself. So this will be the expansion which we end up with. And if you look at the amplitudes, for instance, for T2, you would then need to deal with the nested commutators uh, to a given order. In our case, what happens is that the nested commutators actually this truncates at this order here with fourth nested commutators. And this is due to the character of the interaction. So to derive the same equations, which we derived diagrammatically here, you will now have to go through the evaluations of all these different commutators. And you will see now that where the terms with the, uh, if you look at the term down here, you have an amplitude for this specific case with a t to the power of four, t1 to the power of four. And that would arise in the equations for t2, which is this one. It would arise from this term, which you see here. So that diagram, which you see, when we look at the diagrams here, this last one, which you see down here, this is the one which corresponds to uh, this expression, which you see here. And that arises from this diagram here with four nested commutators. And it's not so difficult to actually, you, you would use the baker campbell hausdorff equation, and it's not so difficult to actually set up all these terms using that expansion. And so when you look at the energy, this uh, energy involves an infinite sum over, in principle, over nested commutators. But when you have this specific uh, non-unitary transformation, then you can show that it truncates naturally, depending on the Hamiltonian. So if you look at the first term, which we have here, which is this term here, this is zero by construction. And that's because we have a normal ordered Hamiltonian. And remember now that the Hamiltonian is a normal ordered piece with respect to the vacuum plus the reference energy. So this is something which will give rise to a contribution to the reference energy. And with the, so the first term here is just zero by construction. Then we have to start looking at these different commutators and actually go through the calculations. So the second term, which we have, that can be split up into the one body piece, which we have, and the T1 and T2, and then we have the two body part and T1 and T2. And then you simply have to go through the calculations of these commutators. And keep in mind now that if we want to look at the uh, diagrammatic way, we can link these expressions now to different diagrams. And remember again that these are uh, now for the energy, these are vacuum to vacuum expectation values. So it's not an operator. So that means we start with an excitation level of zero and we end with an excitation level of zero. So when we are now looking at the diagrams which can contribute, what we saw diagrammatically when we look at the energy, <clears throat> if we go back a little bit here, when we calculated the energy, the energy gave us only three distinct contributions. So this would be a term with only T1 coupling up with this operator F. This would be a uh, two-body term, which would come from the two-body interaction and the T2 amplitude. And this would be the two-body interaction acting together with a T1 and a T1 here. So these were the only possible diagrams. So when we are setting up the excitations here and calculate the different nested commutators, and look at the expectation value, you will then see that there will be specific terms. So these terms are actually the terms which are going to give contributions to the expectation value of the energy. So we can calculate these separately. And now you would simply calculate the expectation values, but using this exercise, which you now all have gotten very fond of, and this is something you, you simply crave after, day after day. Mm -hmm new commutators and anti-commutation relations to evaluate. 
And in this specific case now, what you would have is simply the contractions here. So this is a vacuum to vacuum expectation value. Note again that we have this kind of sloppy way of just leaving out this term and that term. So when we evaluate it, we actually calculating a vacuum to vacuum reference state to reference state expectation value. And in this particular case, what we would do then is simply to uh, uh, reorganize the operators. And we know that we can rewrite it like that. And when we do the calculations then, we end up with uh, different types of contractions. So these are operators which we, oops, sorry. I touched, uh, what did I do here? Here we go. So we just need to run through the contractions and we know that at the end, when we use Wick's theorem, it's only the terms which contain these guys here, which survive. And that means that we get uh, the final term, which is gonna look like this. And then when you do the calculations, we will end up with a term when we perform all the contractions, we are going to end up with a term here, which contains this piece, the first, the first piece here, and then we have this one and that one, and then we have to make the contractions. So then we would have vacuum to vacuum expectation values of these operators. And this term here is the one which is gonna give us that diagram which we saw. So and actually this term here, the vacuum to vacuum term. And uh, this is only going to include terms where the operators are connected by at least one shared index. So these are so-called connected diagrams. And then we can repeat the same with uh, the T2 amplitude and then continue along these lines and perform all the contractions and if we do it with the T2 amplitudes, we are going to get uh, these terms, which you see here. And then you have to squeeze in the vacuum to vacuum expectation values. Now, the reason why I'm setting them up like this now is that if you go back a little bit to what we had in the baker campbell hausdorff expansion, you will see that we have these kind of nested commutators in the expression for the expectation value of the energy, but also in the transition matrix elements from the ground state to the two particle two hole and the one particle one hole. So that means that when you now look at this form here, you would plug that one back in here and you would plug it back in here and similarly in the equation for the one particle one hole piece. So when you now have these terms, as you saw here, so we have looked at this term and that term. Then the only thing we need to do now is to look at the expectation values. So if this is a vacuum state, which we start with, and then we have a two particle, two hole state, you see that for that case, this disappears. This disappears because you end up, this has an excitation level of plus one. And then you are looking at the contribution to the two particle, two hole state. So you will have uncontracted operators and the same with that. If I take the one particle, one hole operator, then that would simply give me a term which leads to a one particle, one hole term here. So if I do the uh, uh, vacuum uh, to a vacuum operator, then clearly this operator here with an A dagger acting on my vacuum state will give me zero. And that would give me zero. Actually, sorry, this this would actually give me zero. So the only term I would be left with would be this term. And then if you take this, uh, the contraction or the, the, the transition uh, matrix elements between the ground state here and the one particle, one whole state, this term here obviously disappears because that's just a constant. And then the only terms which will survive will in that particular case be something like this here, where you create a one particle, one whole term. And then you will do the same thing with this operator. You rewrite it uh, by all these kind of exercises we see here. 
and you end up with something which looks like this. And then you would have to take the uh, uh, calculate the expectation values or transition probabilities between either ground state to ground state or ground state to one particle, one hole, or ground state to two particle, two hole. And then you would again evaluate the matrix elements. And then you would have to do the same thing. So what, I'm, what I've done is to actually include many of these expressions just for the sake of completeness. So we have this term, and now you would repeat this exercise with these different operators. So you see it's pretty exciting. You get this one. And that's why I normally always start with a diagrammatic exp expression, because from the diagrams, you can read off all these terms immediately. And that's the strength of sometimes the diagrammatic expression. So I guess you all feel tempted to go back home now and derive these equations. But there's basically, there's no kind of new insight in doing it, right? It's more just uh, staying clear and keep track of all the contractions which are doing. So I put up all these terms in here so you can actually look at them if you want to. And then you can then plug these in in the calculations of the of the energies. So when you look at the CCD energy, you actually get only two contributions from these terms. And these are these specific terms here. All the high order terms give vanishing contributions. And then you can, so uh, if you then look at the derivation here, you can easily see that there are no, uh, there, will act, uh, there, there will, by the way, come a contribution from the T1 amplitude, which is going to be this one, which we saw. So that will come uh, from uh, a nested commutator with Hn, a double nested commutator with Hn with T1 squared. So this will be the only contribution to the ground state energy. But then when you move on to uh, all the other ones, uh, you have to deal with uh, uh, many, many more terms. <clears throat> So we have no contractions possible between cluster operators. Uh, cluster operators need to contract with free indices to the left, and disconnected parts automatically cancel in the commutator. Two-body operators can connect to a maximum of four cluster operators. And different terms in the expansion, they obviously give different contributions. Now, there's another thing which I wanted just to end up with, and that's the something which, when you're evaluating these diagrams, so these are Einstein summations, which you see here. When you evaluate these diagrams, uh, you would typically rewrite this as a matrix, this as a matrix, and again, this also as a matrix, because then you can perform the calculations for all the outgoing state M and F, and incoming, so you have a state A and B here, which would be this pair of states. And then you have a whole state I and J, which would be these two states. So you can now set up a matrix with A and B and I and J as configurations. So if you have, let's say, 100 of these and thousands of these, your matrix, your final matrix, which includes this diagram here, would be a thousand times a hundred matrix. Then you can reformulate, since these are summations now, you can reformulate the T's here and the matrix elements in terms of matrices. And then you can perform efficient matrix matrix multiplications. Or in case you have a T1 amplitude, you can do matrix vector multiplications. And the thing is that you can pre-calculate some of these terms. So by pre-calculating terms, you can then avoid having to recalculate uh, some of the other terms. So typically, one thing you would do is to recalculate a term like this one, because that can be reused in other places. You may pre-calculate a term like this, and so on. So there are ways by which you can uh, uh, factor out specific terms in the diagram. So each diagram can actually be factored out. So if you look at this diagram here, uh, this diagram, <clears throat> no, wait, uh, it was actually, 
Yeah. So this diagram has a computational cost. So you are looping over four whole states and four particle states. So if you just do the looping without thinking, this is something which is going to give you a computational cost, which goes like number of particles to the power of four, the number of holes to the power of four. Because the Einstein summations involves now a loop over I and J and M and N as whole states. So it's a quadruple loop for the holes and a quadruple loop for the particles. So that has a, has a cost here. If you now look at this diagram here, uh, again, this has uh, the same uh, computational cost, but you can now factor it by pre-calculate this term here. So that means that you would simply pre-calculate this and you would have this from the previous iteration and you can pre-calculate it. And then you would simply perform this matrix matrix multiplication here at the end. So this kind of factoring is normally something which speeds up the uh, calculation of a given diagram. So instead of having a, a four a quadruple loop over the whole states and particle states, you would now end up with having performed this calculation here. You have simply a loop over uh, four whole states and two particle states. So these are just technicalities to think of if you want to write, let's say, a copper cluster code yourself. So there are more technicalities at the end here. You will also find a simple recipe for the copper cluster algorithm, and there are also some costs here on CPU costs and memory costs and so on, if you're interested in looking at that. But the uh, if I'm just setting up the final, so these are the different amplitudes equations. But the typical algorithm is now to have a guess for these amplitudes. And then uh, you would have a table as well. You set up the model space, contain all the single particle degrees of freedom. You have uh, the amplitude, the, the matrix elements, which you need. You have a guess for the amplitudes. And then you have an iterative solution where you start with a, the previous iteration, the equation for the energy, and then you keep iterating. And the way now is, while not converge, the difference between the new one and the old, then you would calculate these intermediates. And then you calculate the uh, new amplitudes. And then when you have the new amplitudes, you calculate the energy, which now is given in terms of these terms here. And then you continue till you have reached this convergence criterion. And then you have your estimate for the ground state energy with a new way of evaluating the correlation energy. So you will find all these slides, these uh, uh, standard slides, they're also in the, in the standard repository for all the teaching material here. So this is going to conclude my part here. So we have gone through many body perturbation theory we have done hartree fock theory, and we used yesterday to repeat a little bit of the basics of uh, money body perturbation theory and hartree fock and uh, FCI theory. So if we look at the semester now, although we uh, treated copper cluster theory in a pretty rush way, uh, I put in more information than I would be able to cover. And hopefully you can use that as a as, as an input to further studies. Uh, we spent time on uh, money body perturbation theory. We looked at diagrammatic representations. We've done Hartree Fock theory as an important uh, kitchen item in money body physics. We've been discussing FCI theory and the basics of that. And then we've looked at particle hole formalism. We looked at the Wicks theorem. Uh, these different interaction pictures and so on. And then we also looked at the uh, operators in second quantization and different ansatzes for representing basis sets. So obviously there's much more we could have covered, but uh, hopefully this gives you a kind of taste and, and an input to understand better when people talk about money body systems.
because it takes some time to build up this kind of intuitions. And I hope the, the course actually has helped in doing that. So I'm going to switch off the recording.